Well, uh, as we've already told you, we are uh, back in my dining room uh, to have a conversational sermon this morning. Uh, this is a message that um, we've been kicking around uh, for quite a while, and I think John is going to talk a little bit about um, the last several months' history of how, how we came to be sitting here yes. together. Um, well, I think it was a March... Uh the March Religious Services Committee meeting when we were talking about who was going to do services. It was January. It was a January. Holy cow, it's that far there. Um, and uh, as part of that, there was a discussion started about uh, generational, about millennials, and I, can I use that I've been or not? Um, old, is boomers old, an offensive word? Is no, that no, 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 old fools. Old fools. I, Let's I, not. I could use another. I could use another adjective, but it probably wouldn't be <laughs> probably wouldn't be acceptable. No. And out of that, so somebody said, "Well, John, why don't you why don't you do a service on that?" And I said, "Okay." And um, so I started to put some things together, and in the process. Uh, because of my lack of understanding and some of my stubbornness, um, I offended some people. And so with the wisdom of our minister, she said, why don't you and I do this? That way we can we, offend people together. Yeah, or offend each other. Offend <laughs> each other, yeah. <laughs> so that's how we kind of got to this place to talk about our generations and the expectations and the dreams and the failures or the, the disappointments, not failures of, of where we come from, from our specific, uh, from our specific age bracket. And now the question that I have is who decided the generations? I'm not, I'm not sure about the answer to that. Who determined, uh, the, the years that the generations would contain yeah. and, and what the names yeah. of the generations are. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I, I do know that um, even in, in the last several months, as we've been talking about a message of this, of this kind, it, it has been at times a very tense conversation. And I think you and I, you and I had coffee yesterday, and I think even you and I were surprised um, by how the word the word that I used was fraught that that these conversations about generational differences and generational divides can feel very very fraught and I think a big part of that is because it's so very personal right yeah I know that as a millennial I have a lot of um, really strong uh, feelings of of solidarity and loyalty and community amongst my peers because we have a lot of us have experienced very similar things there are world events that um, happened over the course of our young lives that really I think influenced the trajectory of sort of where we all wound up and the path we all wound up on and then there's there's always this sort of pitting cultural pitting against between the boomers and the millennials and one of the things that we talked about yesterday that's sort of curious to us is how Generation X is in the middle of all that. And somehow, um, you know, they, they uh, are left out of this conversation. That always seems to happen to Gen X, that they are, they are latchkey kids forever. They're home alone and nobody thinks to include them in this conversation. But, but there's a pitting, a cultural pitting that I think can feel very sensitive and very fraught. And, it's, and it's, it's personal, like I said, but often when millennials are talking about differences they, they see generationally, we're, we're also talking about our parents, right? We're, yeah. we're talking about the generation that, that gave us life, that brought us into this world. Um, and so, and so there's, there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of tension and it can be a hard conversation. Um, and part of what we, we came to yesterday um, and, and the purpose of this message is to talk about how we can build a faith community cross-generationally. How even if we have these differences in perspectives, these differences in the way that we were raised, we're all here, the CVUU, um, 
because we have a common vision, because we share seven religious yes. principles that guide our life. Yes. That's what brings us all here. And even if we have differences, the vision and the mission and, and the work of beloved community draws us in together. And it also keeps us here, even if we experience differences. Even when you and I had some differences yesterday, we gave each other a hug and we said, I love you. And we left and we were fine because we, I think we have a, a common commitment to the relationship that you and I have and yes. to this, and to this community. Yes. Um, and what was so cool about this conversation is, is the commonalities that John and I share. And um, mm -hmm. the term that we came up with was the development of our social consciousness. And, and what happened in our lives that we think inspired our early social consciousness. And there were two things that we both realized we had, had co-experienced. And that was the influence of education mm -hmm. in our lives and the influence of religion. Yep. And I have some things that I want to talk about, about influence, about education and religion in my own growing up. And, but I want first, I want you to talk about your mother and her sisters who were teachers. And I want to hear about being a brethren and being raised a, a pacifist brethren. Um, as I was, each morning I do my sanity walk. I walk about two miles and I put things together and I keep thinking about things that I should talk about. And then uh, the next morning I walk and I, you know, have regroup. But a, uh, a story came to me this morning um, being a pacifist, not only for me personally, but in the family. In World War II, I had an uncle that refused, that was refused to go to war. And he was assigned to the National Institute of Health in Chicago. And he was on a very, very strict diet. And he came home at Christmas time. And I was only, I think I was only two years old, but he couldn't have chicken and mashed potatoes and pie. He had a, so all the family gathered around the table and what do you suppose we had? Fried mush. Oh, wow. And that was our Christmas dinner. And I thought about the, the family cohesiveness of supporting um, Uncle Roy mm -hmm. and what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And so um, that then led to all the other things we, you and I, you and I talked about, but I think the other thing that I want to uh, at least uh, stress a little bit is the generation that I grew up in, um, and the and the boomers were the ones that um, you know we were part of in involving uh, Lyndon Johnson signing. Uh, the Civil, Rights, the Civil Act. Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. We were involved in uh, bringing the end of the Vietnam War. We were out in the streets. We were, I did draft counseling for kids to try to, or yeah, young people who were wanting not to go and didn't know how to get there. So I helped them in the, in the process. Uh, the women's awareness thing that really bloomed and exploded in the early 70s. And the, those of us, and that is, that is what brought me here to the church is the social consciousness and the, mm -hmm. and the community that we have that is supportive of all those. You know, Al is doing this, the thing on, you know, getting after the, the county attorney. Yeah, yeah. I'm all in. <laughs> I know. We, I, have you written your letter yet? I, I got to write. Good for you. I still got to write I tried letter. to make him feel as guilty as I could. Good. Yeah, really stick it to him. <laughs> um, it's interesting that you, you bring up pacifism because that was something that we talked about yesterday. So my dad, uh, he was born in 1950 and uh, he uh, was 18 uh, when uh, the Vietnam War began and his draft number was picked and he had a very high draft number uh, and he was not going to be drafted. And so he decided uh, to go off to college at that point. Um, but I've talked a lot about um, being a cradle Methodist growing up in the Methodist church. Um, my father is a pacifist. He's, he's been an, an avowed pacifist uh, my whole life. It's been something that he's talked about and really believed in. Um, and his pacifism, like your pacifism, 
comes directly from his religious faith. Um, the ministry of Jesus was uh, the foundation of my religion when I was a kid. And um, stories about Jesus Christ's ministry and, and the, the really, truly like radical things that he did. I was telling you about how when I was a little kid, one of the most frequent stories that I heard was about uh, Christ turning over the tables of the money changers in the temple and how people uh, wonder how it can be that I'm an anti-capitalist. Well, I'm an anti-capitalist because <laughs> I was a cradle Methodist and Jesus was an anti-capitalist. And so that was, was the very beginning of my social conscious. That was the very beginning of, of me um, understanding uh, that Christianity specifically um, was a religion for the marginalized. We talked about, I grew up in the town where the state hospital was, where um, folks that suffered with mental illness um, were hospitalized. Uh, and then released uh, in the town where I grew up. And there was a, a group home right next to my church and that many of the people that lived in the group home attended my church. And so uh, really from the very, very start, um, my religion that I was raised in woke up that social consciousness that, is, that continues to, to be so strong in me today as a Unitarian Universalist. And the other thing, uh, your mother was a teacher. Mm -hmm. All of her sisters were teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like some of them were very strong women with unconventional <laughs> approaches to life, especially for their era. That, that's an understatement. An understatement, yeah. You didn't know Aunt Helen. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would have really liked her um, from what I've heard. Um, but for me, my mom went back to school when I was in about fifth grade. And, and I watched her go back to school and pursue education and eventually get a job with the USDA. Um, and I knew how empowering education was for my mom. I, I watched that. Um, and I, I think that that was a big part of the reason that I wanted to go to college because I saw what it did for my mother. Um, and I think that being raised yourself by a woman who believed in education, well, that had to have had some impact. Yeah, there wasn't any choice. Yeah. I mean, when it came time to graduate from high school and but we were automatic, it was automatic. You know, I was going off to college. Yeah, no question. Um, and that obviously, as I told you before, uh, was kind of footloose and fancy free for the first two years. And then my, for my junior year, my father said, them set me down and said, uh, if you don't come back to the farm, I'm going to rent it. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm done. Mm -hmm. And so I did a 180 in terms of my uh, of my college uh, studies, mm -hmm. and then and then came back. And uh, the woman that I happened to marry is also a teacher. Mm -hmm. So it's it kind of in it's kind of in our blood. The question that I have though is that from what I gathered from some of the conversations is that even though you, the, the education was important, um, there are times when you feel that some resentment about, uh, about what you did and from those of us who are in a different generation. Can you talk about that a little? Well, it's, it's hard to talk about um, because I don't like pointing fingers. I don't think that that is productive. Millennials are the most educated generation ever. We have, we have more, genera more education than any generation that has come before us. And college, I think for me also, college was, was the expectation. Um, I was accepting of that expectation. I, I, I wanted to pursue higher education. Um, I struggled in, uh, in school before I got to college. I have a host of learning disabilities and things that we've, that I've mentioned before, but I, I very much wanted to go to school. But I went into college in 2006. Um, I graduated in 2010 at the height of the recession um, when, when the cost of higher education was 
skyrocketing. Um, and myself and the majority of my peers now have just, we're really saddled with a lot of debt. Um, and, the, and debt uh, causes complications you know debt makes that makes your life a lot harder and do you think that those of us uh in uh, other generations have not appreciated that fact i don't think that my i don't think that the feelings that i have are about the generations not appreciating student debt i think what frustrates me is the brokenness of the system and that education shouldn't be this expensive, mm -hmm. especially if it is an expectation. If, if it's something that you need to be employed, then it shouldn't be cost prohibitive. And a degree shouldn't come with a price tag that means you can't buy a house or you can't raise children. Um, so it's, so it's not about the generations, it's about the system. And I spend, I feel like, uh, I spend a lot of Sundays railing against the system. <laughs> so, You're the only one. The only one, yeah. Well, I'm the only one with the microphone, I guess, <laughs> on Sunday mornings. So, but so where did the, um, there's a lot of commonality that we, that we share between generations. So where did the, where did the clash come for us? I think the clash comes when we make assumptions instead of asking questions. I think that's where the clash comes in. Mm. I think the clash comes in when we stereotype other people, when we when we stereotype boomers as, for example, not knowing uh, not knowing how to use technology. Well, obviously, boomers know how to use technology. Look at all of us here. You know, look at what we <laughs> learned in the last fifteen months. Or the assumption or the stereotype that uh, millennials are entitled. Millennials, millennials aren't entitled. We're uh, sick and tired of, of mm. working so hard and not making a living wage. So I, I, think, I think the tension comes when we fail to be curious about each other, when we fail to ask questions, when we, when we fail to seek out those commonalities. It was so cool to learn that you were also raised by pacifists. Hmm. I didn't I didn't know that about you. And I know that for me, being raised by a pacifist absolutely impacted my worldview, absolutely impacted the choices that I made. I think we have a lot more in common than we don't. Yeah. And, and I, I'd like us, I think the way to build beloved community is to Start with curiosity, start with questions, find your commonalities. And once you have those commonalities, I think that that opens up our hearts to mm -hmm. listen more compassionately to where we are different. That was pretty good. I think we should I, end it there. I agree. I, yeah. I, can't, I can't add anything to that. <laughs> I, think, I think we're gonna call that sermon. <laughs> All right. Put Thank that, you, John. Put that in the box. Put in the box. Thank you. Thank you. I, it, it helps. I hope the rest of the folks got some good out of our conversations and learning not only about us, but also about how how we deal with each other yeah. in, a, in different generations. I love talking to you. <laughs> I really do. I love talking to you. Thanks for listening, folks. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> <laughs>